under the Controlled Substances Act and Corollary State Law, the growth, trafficking, sale, possession, or consumption of psychedelics may be a felony punishable by imprisonment, fines, forfeiture of property, or some combination thereof. Psychedelic X is for general information only. Information provided on the show does not constitute legal advice, nor does your listening to the show create an attorney-client relationship with the host. Hello, I'm attorney Gary Smith, and I want to welcome you to another episode of Psychedelic Alex, The Law of Psychedelics, my ongoing exploration of the question of the law of psychedelics. So, Josh Kappel, welcome, welcome to Psychedelic Alex, The Law of Psychedelics, my ongoing exploration of the question of the law of psychedelics. And you are, sir, a fellow psychedelic attorney. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Thanks for having me. Oh, my, my pleasure. Uh, let's get you introduced properly to the audience. I understand you are one of the founding partners at uh, Vicente Sederberg, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, or is it Cederberg? Cederberg. Cederberg, Cederberg Vicente yeah. Cederberg. And you are, uh, I guess you split time between L.A. and Denver. Is that right? The, the, that's, yeah, that's correct. I mean, you know, you know, we, you know, we started Vicente Cederberg, you know, on the cusp of medical cannabis legalization um, about, I guess, 12 years ago now. And, um, you know, in the last oh, four or five years, I've been, you know, I'm licensed in California and licensed in, in Colorado. And I've been bouncing between the two, even though, you know, with the pandemic, I've been, um, more, more in Colorado, I'd say. That's nicer in Colorado. I've been to both places. <laughs> <laughs> I used to live in San Diego too. Actually, I take that back. San Diego is amazing. I can't say enough nice things about it, but that's years ago. Yeah. San, San Diego, San Diego is pretty great. And, and so is Denver. I mean, both, both places are nice, you know, for sure. Now, for the audience's benefit, uh, you and I ended up meeting because we're both members of the Psychedelic Bar Association, and you recently uh, gave a a nice presentation to the Law and Regulatory Committee on a Colorado initiative that is possibly up for the next election, yes? Yeah, so so great news. Um, You know, breaking news this week is that, you know, the Natural Medicine Health Act is, you know, is the name of our initiative, Initiative 58, has qualified for the ballot in Colorado. So we will be on the ballot this November. Um, you know, it's a very transformative, you know, piece, and I'm super excited to talk about it. Okay, and and for statistics nerds, if you know, how many signatures did you need to qualify for the ballot, and how many did you actually obtain? So, that's that's a great question. Um, roughly, we needed 130 thousand to qualify, and we turned in roughly 220 thousand. Amazing. Um, and, and that allowed us to qualify. You know, they took a random sample, you know, for your statistic nerds, they take a random sample and then they extrapolate from that random sample if there's enough signatures to make it based on how many are valid. And so we passed the random sample test um, and so we qualified. Perfect. And for the folks at home who maybe don't have experience with political campaigns or trying to get initiatives onto a ballot, you have to acquire a certain number of signatures based upon a formula established by uh, your local law, which could be as uh, specifically high as a constitutional requirement or a local statute. And the deal is, if you don't obtain all of those necessary signatures, your item doesn't advance to get on the ballot. So resultingly, it is often the case that there are folks out there who try to knock your signatures out by deeming them invalid or, or otherwise improper. So... That's why campaigns like this always shoot to get way more signatures than they need. And that, by the way, was why I asked you. Yeah. And I also think it's worth noting, you know, you know, while we're talking about the initiative process, you know, many states don't have an initiative process. Correct. You know, and so, you know, so Colorado is, you know, is one of the states that does. And those allowed us to like put together really, you know, progressive people forward laws. Um, you know, and I think one thing to note about this measure is that it's a statutory measure and not a constitutional measure. Um, in part, you know, because you know, re- recently in Colorado, they changed the requirements to pass a constitutional measure that it requires 55% of the voting of the vote and it has a higher signature requirement. Um, you know, so this, it being statutory allows, it also allows the legislature to, you know, to amend it, to, you know, interpret it differently. There's a lot more leeway as well, you know, as baking it, 
compared to baking it into our constitution. Yeah, for sure. And you and I are both lucky that we live in states that do allow public initiatives. And you're right, not every state does. There's only 14 out of 50 that permit this, and therefore it's special and rare, but has been regarded as the most democratic way of participating in law and regulation because it's a devo- it's a vote that goes directly to the public and you get to decide your own laws. Yeah, correct. <laughs> yeah. So this means at this moment, your initiative has at least a quarter million Coloradans deeply interested and in the rest you haven't heard from yet. Yeah, that, that is right. And, you, you, and we've had a lot of positive feedback, you know, collecting signatures. You know, people are very excited about anything that, you know, that can address our mental health crisis here. And people are excited, you know, about, you know, what natural psychedelics could mean, you know, just for, you know, human optimization and wellness and growth. Sure. So let, let's talk about what the initiative actually is and what it hopes to accomplish. Can you give us an overview of what the intention of the initiative is? Yeah. So, you, you know, the purpose behind the measure, you know, is is to allow for any adult in Colorado who needs access to psychedelics, these natural psychedelic medicines, um, to have access to them, you know, and, um, you know, when whether that's for PTSD or or trauma or depression or addiction or, you know, human optimization, or you're just kicking a bad habit. You know, it's like for, you know, really for any reason, your goal is like, Hey, for people who could benefit from these, you know, from these natural medicines, let's, let's provide access to them. Um, you know, and then the, the access really comes in two different forms. I mean, there's, you know, a regulated public model that, uh, that allows for, um, it's sort of public facing. It allows for any adult to go there or adults. It could be one or, or many for a for a facilitated and supervised psychedelic experience. Um, you know, so this is you go to a he- what we're call, what we call in the measure healing centers. You'd go to a healing center. You would you know work with a licensed facilitator. There'd be a prep. There'd be a preparation session. There'd be the actual experience you know, with the psilocybin or psilocybin, which is the first natural medicine that's permitted. And then there'd be an integration session. It all sort of t- the, the actual psychedelic experience would take place at the, at the healing center. And, you know, and so that's our sort of public facing model. And it's really important that there's not, there's no retail sales contemplated here. It's not, Hey, we're going to go to a healing center, get a bunch of mushrooms and then go to the woods. It's, Hey, we're going to experience this at the healing center. So that's, you know, sort of, you know, the first prong, you know, the first major prong of this. And then the second major prong is, you know, is around sort of like the decriminalization for personal use and sort of our, you know, the purpose here was like, hey, can we provide access? Can we, you know, decriminalize and provide, you know, can we decriminalize what's currently happening in our underground psychedelic community and continue to provide access in, in that manner? Um, you know, and so that, you know, allows for adults to, to, possess, to cultivate, to share. Um, it allows in this sort of like private model, it allows for, um, har- you know, for someone to be paid for harm reduction services or therapy services. And the intent there is like, hey, how do we take our current system, not interrupt access, and sort of like bring it out of the shadows, you, you, you know, make that permitted. Um, there's is like a number of limitations on sort of like this private model where there's also, you know, sales aren't permitted and there's no advertising. You know, so it's like, you know, currently as our current psychedelic community works, it's not really advertising anyways. You know, so the idea is like, hey, let's, you know, keep this from happening. But, you know, for those who haven't, you know, who don't have the privilege of being a part of that community, um, you know, they'll have this public facing regulatory model. Hmm. Could, could I sum it up this way that, that the goal there is permission, not promotion? I think that's great. You know, it's, you know, it's you know, providing permission. Yeah, you know, for the current community community as is without sort of like having them be able to promote all their services in an unregulated fashion. All right. Listen, if permission, not promotion shows up on T-shirts, 10 percent. OK. All right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Cool. So you're at your you're in your measure actually asks and answers two questions, which, which sounds like number one decriminalizing so people can at least engage without the threat of, of prosecution or jail. Uh, but then that leads to the obvious second question, which is, okay, great, we've decriminalized. Now, how do we get it? And you're answering that question too. And you're taking out the illicit drug dealer from the scenario and putting in a responsible um, government-approved agent effectively. Is that essentially what it would be? 
Yeah, on the, you know, on the public facing side, yeah, it'd be sort of like a government approved, you know, facilitator and a government approved um, business. And then on sort of like the private, you know, permission, non promotion side, um, yeah, it's just the current community, you know, sort of like anyone, but there's no sales allowed. So it's, you know, it's more of like a, a gift, you know, so that, that the grow gather gift model is, you know, some of the, uh, you know, the decrim folks have have coined. Okay. And some of this to my ears has echoes of, um, what's going on in Oregon right now. Did you guys source any of your measure based off of anything that they wrote or did or, or have been pursuing? Yeah. So, you know, you know so I would like to consider like, like the first parts are like the public facing part of our measure is very similar to Oregon. Um, I think, you know, there's a couple key differences, you know, that I'd like to, you know, that I think are worth highlighting, um, but it is, you know, it's similar and, you know, and, and so it's similar in the fact that it's on-site supervised use. You know, it starts with just psilocybin and psilocybin. Um, you know, the, you know, then we can add in other products, but that's, that's a difference. Um, and, you know, and then it's sort of the facilitators are, you know, there's no prerequisites to be a facilitator. You know, it'd be like a standalone sort of like facilitator training program. Some key differences though, you know, between the two is, you know, ours is, you know, very, you know, has built in sort of equity and reciprocity measures. So it requires, you know, the regulatory agency to, you know, look at equitable access to these services. Um, you know, it's, you know, paying someone to sit with someone for eight hours. It's just, it's inherently cost prohibitive for a mm. number of people. Yeah. Um, you know, and so, you know, there's, you know, so there's, you know, there's sort of a mandate to look at equitable access that also allows, and part of that mandate is a funded mandate, you know, so they can take money from this fund that's created to sort of like support those programs. And then also equitable ownership, um, you know, you know, of these businesses, like how, you know, you know, there's a mandate for equitable ownership. And there's also sort of like a mandate for like geographical diversity, you know, that we don't want these, you know, facilities only in the major metropolitans and sort of like leaving certain communities out. Um, and then, you know, there's a piece as well that sort of like requires, you know, a report to be done every year that says the efficacy of these programs, you know, like, are they working? How, what, what, how should we change it? Um, you know, so that's like, you know, I think a key piece, you know, key difference. And along those same lines, you know, there's, there's an advisory board that's set up and there's an advisory board or the mandate of the advisory board is also to sort of look, look at what sort of like cultural practices are, are happening. You know, and, and what, what is, you know, and what's happening, you know, to, you know, you know, these, you know, traditions, you know, you know that we, a lot of these like set and setting in different um, parts of psilocybin therapy have really taken from these prior traditions. So a lot of, you know, there's a mandate to sort of like look at this and how do we address this and like, and how do we tinker with the program to sort of like honor those that came before us. Um, you know, so that's like, a, I think a key piece, um, you know, that's like a big difference. There's also a lot more regulatory flexibility in our measure than in Oregon. Um, you know, so it's, you know, which, you know, could go either way, you know, in some cases, that's a great thing. And in some cases, that's a bad yeah, thing. That's, that's always the toughest thing to do when drafting regulatory legislation is how tight do you make the guitar strings, right? Do you hem, mm. hem that agency in so they can't move and it breaks or do you keep it so slack they don't get anything done? Right. <clears throat> Yeah. And, you, you know, it's, you know, I think it's just, you know, it depends on a lot of times it depends on like your, how much you trust government, you know, and that, and, I, and, and really it's like, sometimes I like, like to look at that question is like, how much do you distrust government? You know, <laughs> you know, it's well, like where. This... <laughs> yeah. Well, depending on which seat you're in, that's a fair question yeah. in both directions. So sure. Yeah. And the, um, yeah. And there's like some other pieces, you know, so, you know, that are different, you know, than like the Oregon model, um, one is that there's, you know, there's not a local opt out, like localities can't ban these businesses. Um, there's sort of provisions to allow for our Colorado Medicaid to like, you know, hopefully reimburse maybe like the preparation or the integration session if those services would otherwise be covered. Um, there's provisions that, you know, would create a tiered facilitator training. So it's like, you know, the idea behind that is, you know, if someone's going for, you know, for natural medicine services and they want to work, you know, and they need to like dive into trauma or they're dealing with PTSD or they're you know, dealing with depression, that the, tr the facilitators have a different skill set than if it's like, hey, I am going for, you know, my, you know, for, you know, to 
figure out what I want to do in the next 10 years. So if I'm, you know, or a completely different skill set, like, hey, I'm going for like a spiritual experience. Like they're different sort of like skill sets that should be required from the facilitators based off of like the participant and the indication and the, and the why. Mm-hmm. I mean, so I think that's like a, you know, a big difference as well. Yeah. I, I like that particular nuance, especially, um, cause you're, you're absolutely right. People approach these substances for a variety of reasons. And having a one-size-fits-all program eh, works for some, not for all. This sounds great. Yeah, and and part of it, too, it's like you know, maybe, you know, and I, I get hopeful when I think about, like, the regulations that come out, but it's going to be a lot of work, you know. But, you know, like, like I like to see that, hey, hey maybe there's a, a, you know, there's different, like, levels of facilitator training that, like, give you more privileges of, like, the stuff you could do. So it's like you don't. So we don't require folks who want to participate as a facilitator to like dive into all of these hours, many things sort of like step into it, you know, based off of, you know, based off of the participants. And, and there's also, it also clearly states too that, you know, there's, you know, credit given on the training for those who have had um, practice or have worked with these natural medicines in the past. Mm -hmm. Um, And also, you know, who have worked in like a a therapy setting in the past, you know, so it's like the idea is like, Hey, how do we, again, sort of like, bring in, you know, you know, to bring in those who know the most about things. Yeah. This is going to be such fertile ground as time moves forward to try to ferret out what good standards are for different facilitators and what different types of facilitators and who can qualify and what those qualifications are and, you know, what the regulatory options are on those people. That's all great stuff. That's got to be invented. Yeah, because it's, you know, like, you know, it's a very interesting, it's a very interesting debate because on one hand, it's, hey, we want this to be accessible. We don't want to create barriers to entry that are unreasonable or that only those who are well off can afford the training. On the other hand, you know, it's like we're also dealing with schedule one, very potent medicines, you know, that, you know, have, you know, lasting impacts on people's psyches, you know. You know, in, in many cases for good, but not always, you know. And so, you know, it's like, you know, when I look at, you know, it's like, hey, is, you know, should the training be, you know, more, should it be like 500 hours, like a yoga teacher, or should it be 20 years, like a psychiatrist? It's like, you know, I think there's like, you know, you know, I think how this will play out, it'll be more along like the smaller, like 500 hours or, or less, but we'll see. You know, I think there's different people, you know, you know, just all over the spectrum about what sort of training should be required. Mm. Yeah, and, and on your comment about the expense too, this was a conversation you and I started a, a couple of weeks ago at the at the Psychedelic Bar Association, and I wanted to definitely dive into that. So I thank you for giving me the segue opportunity in the conversation yeah. to go there. So setting the stage for, for the listeners, these are incredibly expensive businesses to open and, and get operating. Uh, you've got facilities that you've either got to own or lease, and because of the presence and and inclusion of schedule one substances that creates a whole panoply of problems because you're going to have landlords who are going to feel really uncomfortable because if for example they themselves have mortgages they have to pay typically those mortgages are going to include terms and clauses that say hey uh, you can't use the mortgage facilities for illegal purposes schedule one substances are of course illegal purposes and that you know could trigger foreclosures or defaults for for landowners so you've got to find either a really risk tolerant landowner or come up with the money yourself and own that land so you don't have to worry about it other than for yourself. Uh, then, you know, you've got to worry about insurance. And right now, the insurance market for psychedelics is virtually non-existent in this context. There are some companies that are out there. They're not a paper companies and their premiums are hellaciously expensive. Hellaciously, as the folks in Oregon are learning, unfortunately. So those are just two of multiple barriers. So, so Josh, what's the conversation in Colorado like about that? How are people thinking they're going to surmount those problems? Or do they not even acknowledge them as problems? No, I mean, I think, <clears throat> great question, you know, and I think that there's like a couple, a couple pieces, you know, I think there's a couple pieces of this puzzle, you know, um, one is, you know, it's like part of, you know, us having this decrim model in this allows for like existing therapists to continue, you know, you know, it doesn't require, 
you know, it doesn't require them to obtain a property and get a license. And, you know, they can kind of just continue what they're doing, you know? So, you know, it, so it shouldn't in that sense, like actually increase costs from what's currently happening. Now, now, you know, on the, on the sort of barriers to entry on like the public side, on the regulated side, I think it's, I think it's really interesting to know, um, you know, a couple of things, you know, one is, I hear you. It's like, you know, like the co- the property in general is very expensive. You know, it's like, you know, property in Colorado is also very expensive. Um, you know, landlords, you know, we've seen, you know, the the cannabis, the cannabis lease rates for, you know, and, you know, and all the issues, you know, there. Um, yeah, and, I, I've know, negotiated those leases. Can I confirm? Yeah. <laughs> They're expensive. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and I think, well, I think we'll see that here. You know, I think, you know, there's local governments, you know, have zoning authority, um, you know, and, you know, so that they might limit it to certain places. And then, you know, and then there's really a fight, you know, for, for what locations. Um, I do think though that there's, I think, you know, I think that there's a couple, you know, pieces of, of, you know, a couple of pieces of relief on the property side. One is that since localities can't ban, I think we'll see more available property. Um, you know, and, and, you know, and I think it'll, it'll vary. There's also the cost of opening up like a therapy suite is different than opening up a retail store or different than opening up like a cannabis manufacturing factory. Um, you know, and, you know, and so, you know, I do think from, from like a, a therapy standpoint, um, you know, just like your overall building costs and, and building code compliance is going to be a lot different, you know, and, but, but I do think we'll see it like, you know, what sort of use will this fall under, you know, under the international building code, you know, and will it require a change of use and what sort of, exp- you know, expenses will, will be involved there. Um, you know, so, but I do think there is some substantial differences. I think insurance, yes, it's expensive. And I do think it'll come down, um, you know, th- th- you know, it's just the nature of, of insurance and it's just the nature of like insurance in an illegal industry, you know, and, you know, but, but with that said, you know, it's like, that is also sort of like a cost prohibitive piece of this. Yeah. Um, well, you know, the, the, with, the underwriters want the premiums. They just don't understand the risks yet. So their, their high premiums simply reflect the uncertainties. Right. And, you know, and, and I think a lot of people don't understand the risks yet. You right. know, uh, you know, even even probably both of us, you know, until it's you know, you know truly out there. Agreed. Um, but there is, you know, it's like, like like I mentioned earlier, the one thing we have in Colorado is that there's a fund that's created, um, you know, that sort of it's based off of fees of these businesses based off of their size. You know, so the larger businesses will pay higher fees. And with that fund, you know, the there is regulatory authority to use that fund for all those equity provisions I talked about earlier. Hmm. Um, you know, so it's like how much money will be in that fund? What will be the focus of it? Will be, you know, will the focus be, hey, let we gotta stand at the regulatory program and there's nothing left, or is there, hey, we can actually have something left and like work on this equitable access issue or you know, or sort of like financial diversity amongst ownership in these businesses. Um you know, you know, I think that's going to, you know, still, you know, to be determined. Um, you know, my hope is that it's like, you know, to me, it's like, you know, t- my hope is, you know, is that we can, you know, can appropriately sort of like, you know, level the playing field, you know, so we can see, you know, very diverse, you know, ownership and, and access to these things, you know, access to these services. Um, there is a lot of conversations too about, you know, it's like, you know, of like, hey, can we set up separate businesses that actually provide the psilocybin and then, you know, they use it on a different business so as to sort of like isolate 280E costs, um, you know, because, that, you know, that's going to be, you know, I, I was going to go there next. So thanks. Again. <laughs> yeah. You are just the gift of segue. So thank you. <laughs> keep going. Keep going. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> no, I mean, like, you know, I, I just, you know, we don't know what that's going to look like. We don't know if like if trafficking in a controlled substance involves supervising someone using it. Um, my guess is it wouldn't, but you know, it's, you know, sort of like an unanswered question, you know, in that regard. Yeah. Well, the, uh, the, the big Harbor side decision from a couple of years ago really at least made it clear that the IRS will look beyond the primary business entity. It's definitely going to cast that net as wide as it can, or at least can get away with. So these are real fears. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. And you, you know, you know, and Dave Koblak out of, um, I don't know if he's been on your show, but out of Oregon, you know, I know, yeah, his I, I have spoken with people. Dave on, on occasion. I haven't had him on yet, but it's he's he is coming. Fear not. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it's you know I think overall there is some very large barriers, you know, and I think you know there's groups that are trying to figure it out. You know, it's like like when we're seeing it. I think the analogy right now to look at is sort of like the ketamine clinics, and you have you know I think a group that's really you know pushing the envelope here is the Sage Institute in Oakland. Um, you know, they're a nonprofit based, you know, community ketamine clinic that is really, you know, really focused on trying to figure out this question, like, how do we provide equitable access? Is it we're charging? You know, is it sliding scales? Is it donations? Like, like, what does this look like? So it's like we can actually provide access to these natural medicines to anyone who needs it, regardless of their financial position. Yeah, agreed. Because ultimately, you're talking about just making available something that would grow out of the dirt on its own anyway. Right. But you're right. dropping all of this regulation and infrastructure on top of it, and thus a price tag pops out of it. Right. Well, and it's, you know, just, you know, it's the cost of, it's also just the cost of the guides and, the, you know, and the therapist. It's like from a pure, you know, it's like on one hand, it's like the cheaper that service is that service is the less you're paying the therapist and the guides, you know? And so like, what is like the right balance? And like, if they're being paid a fair wage, like it, does that just inherently make the service inaccessible for some? And so without some sort of like sliding scale to sort of, you know, <clears throat> take from Paul to pay Peter sort of system, like, you know, or some government intervention, I don't see how you address that, the access problem. Yeah, there's only so far you can get priced down without subsidizing. Right. Yeah, that's and and I think even in in like the FDA licit world of of these psychedelics that are eventually like in the next two years going to be FDA approved, you're still going to bang into that, but in a worse worse financial iteration, you know, because we've got iterations of psilocybin and MDMA that are both on track. The, they'll get approval, but I, I suspect tied to clinics and hellaciously expensive there. So, mm -hmm. so you you get the the junior version of that, but junior is not even that much smaller, right? Because you know it's like you know for example with you know MDMA or psilocybin through you know through a like pharma clinician model, you, know, you have to involve a psychiatrist, you know, and that's you know and that's not going to be you know a cheap task, and then you still have like the therapist, or if you look at you know, some of the newer protocols, you have two therapists that you're paying to be there. Yeah. Um, you know, I will say another piece of what, what we, what we put in ours, you know, that I do think will address some of the, uh, the cost issues related to facilities is that there's a mandate for regulations around facilitators being able to go to someone's house or to go to a healthcare facility. Like a uh, now that's a great yeah. solution. Yeah. If, if you, know, you can get mobile so, facilitators though, that, oh, that's a game changer. Yeah. Yeah, so, so then it's like, you know, that piece, you know, and what does, you know, a lot of us may flesh out the regulations, but that piece would allow facilitators to not have to invest in property and the location, you know, and all of a sudden sort of like the barriers to entry are very different, you know, and it's just the training. Yeah, and consistent with set and setting. I mean, going to some sterile office somewhere compared to uh, even just staying in the comfort of your own home, which you are most familiar with, just makes so much better sense to stay home. Sure. Right. Uh, what about any contemplation of outdoor experience? Because nature being the best setting for such an event, uh, I would think folks would want to go off into a lovely forest somewhere in the mountains and do what they do. Is that available in, in contemplation under this measure? Yes. You know, 100% that is sort of like outdoor use under the facilitated model is like contemplated and, and it, I'm sorry, and, and, and encouraged too. The, um, you know, like what exactly that looks like, I think is still, you know, still kind of like t to be determined. Um, you know, the, you know, but there's, there's definitely a lot of talk like, oh, we'll have this, you know, outdoor retreat center and, you know, people can just be in nature and have nature therapy. And, and cause, cause I hear you, I think that's some of the best, the best times for a lot of the, you know, a lot of these medicines. Um, it does run up, to, you know, it's like a big issue in Colorado, though, is that a lot of our outdoor spaces are federal, you know, and so, you know, it's like, hey, you want to go hike a 14 or it's most likely a national forest, you know, and so, 
you know, that doesn't mean that like people haven't been eating mushrooms, hiking mountains in Colorado forever. Sure. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's just, it just means that is still not going to be lawful because we just can't change federal law by a state ballot measure. And so, you know, all the parts of, you know, of Colorado's beautiful outdoors, which are federal lands, BLM land or national forest land, um, you know, it's still not going to be lawful to, to use or, or possess these. In those sure. And, you know, that's worth pausing for a moment to remind the audience, for those of you who are not lawyers or don't know this issue well, uh, there are multiple layers of jurisdiction here. And, and what Josh and I are talking about is strictly and exclusively a Colorado state level measure. It will have zero impact on the federal prohibition, which will very much still be in place and schedule one federal remains schedule one federal. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, and I think along those lines, like we don't really know how the federal government's going to react. Um, you, you know, we have this sort of like policy of tolerance with the, with the last Ill federally illegal industry that we created. And I um, mean, you, you know, I think we assume and hope that you know, th a similar policy of tolerance continues. Um, but, you know, but there's no guarantee there. Yeah, for, for sure. And, and cannabis continues to enjoy coverture of the riders that have been attached to the spending bill year over year. That's the only main reason we don't see significant enforcement going on because uh, the Cole and Ogden memos were repealed during the Trump administration. So cannabis's protection is really effectively now almost by fiat. But I don't think anybody at the federal level has the will to try to reverse the gains we've made this far. But you're right, psychedelics is a totally different subject for that. The hope is perhaps one day we'll get the equivalent of a Cole or an Ogden memo that'll let us at least play out this experiment in the crucibles of the 50 states, but remains to be seen. Yeah, and, and I also think it's like a very good reason to why we have this two-tiered system in the in the Natural Medicine Health Act, where we have this like public regulatory model and also this you know permissive decrim model. Because if, if the feds do say, like, hey, we're not going to let you move forward on this regulatory model, we're going to target these businesses, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't, for, you know, we've already changed state law and we still have this, you know, permissive decrim model. Yeah, and that's always a good first step. So what's a uh, prediction as far as uh, success at the ballot box? Going in with high confidence, pardon the pun? <laughs> you know, I think it, it really just depends. You know, there's, there's a, you know, a hundred, some, maybe 90 days until election day. Um, a lot can happen. There's a lot of money that needs to be raised and there's a lot of messaging, you know, that needs to happen. I mean, the truth of the matter is, is, you know, a lot of the public doesn't really know much about, you know, psychedelics, you know, you know, still it's, you know, I think with Michael Pollan's Netflix documentaries and a couple other pieces, it's like becoming more of a mainstream issue. But like what we've seen is like a lot of the public doesn't know. And so there needs, sure. there's a lot of education that has to happen. And, you know, and, you know, so, yeah, so it's like, I think if, you know, if everything can, can come together, if we can sort of like rally the supporters and garner the support, I think, you know, there's a very, very good chance of success. Are there any vocal opponents that are out there? Um, you know, there is, you know, there is some vocal opponents. Um, you know, there's, there's sort of a competing, you know, or potentially competing ballot measure that just decriminalizes um, certain natural psychedelics. Okay. So they're, they're still pro change of policy. They just want a different iteration. Right, right. And any voices that are just anti all of this that are, are out there? Not, I mean, not that we've like seen quite yet. There's, you know, you know there's like some comments from some of the like anti marijuana lobby in the state, you okay. know, that was, you, you know, kind of echoing that they, you, you know, were not in favor of this. But I also just don't think they really understand the measure, you know, and understand that this isn't, you know, a retail sales dispensary model, that this is a, you know, healing, you know, therapeutic facilitated use models, like stupid fairy control. Hmm. Well, this, that's fascinating that you're not having vocal opponents popping up. I'm analogizing to what happened here in my own state of Arizona during the various times we had cannabis initiatives run. Um, and each time, man, prosecutors, county attorney plural came out openly vocally opposed to this. Police agencies came out openly vocally opposed to this. It all passed and the sky didn't fall and everything's great. But at least, you know, we had identified naysayers who were 
vocal about it. I'm really surprised you don't have that in Colorado. Happy to hear it, by the way. Don't misunderstand the message. Just surprised. So that's that's a nice portent going into the election. Right. I will also say, you know, it's, knock on wood, you know, we just qualified for the ballot. You know, and so I think, you know, you know, in Colorado, many, many people start gathering signatures, you know, and, and it, you know, and not as many actually qualify for the ballot. So I think we'll see, you know, a conversation of the pros and cons, you know, really, you know, really start to take place over the next, you know, four months here, I guess, three and a half months. Um, so, you know, I, we'll see who comes out, you know, and, yeah. you know, in support of it and it, who, who, against it. I think it'll be surprising on both sides. Yeah, I'm really eager to hear what the, the anti people have to say. I'd love to know what today's current logical arguments are in opposition to this, because I, I, I'm just stymied. I would love to hear it if it exists. Yeah, the well, what I find fascinating by the by the decrim only camp is I think one of their main arguments, and they're just in the Denver Post about this, is that our measure will like corporatize psychedelics. You know that there's this like fear of the you know of the corporatization of psychedelics, um, and and I and I get that. I have like I share you know it's like I share I share that concern. Um, and I think there's like a couple key things of why I think like what we're doing will actually like limit that. But what I will note is that like decrim only doesn't stop corporatization. You know, like when we, you know, it's like when we had decrim only in California, we had a, th- a thousand dispensaries in LA. You know, when we had decrim only in in Colorado and this like caregiver model of cannabis, you know, we had another thousand dispensaries and and a lot of them were like unregulated there are people who came into the system who didn't care about the long-term health of it and just want to make a quick dollar until they could it, you know and so yeah. you know it's like i'm super supportive of decrim but not on the reasons that it's going to stop the corporization of psychedelics i think decrim only actually encourages unchecked rampant capitalism and psychedelics and you know and so, you know but that's just you know, that's just my view i do think what we've been trying to do in terms of our model is like getting out ahead on this is like you know a couple of things one is like we have a very clear sort of like equity provisions built in you know so, so we have this built in on this like public facing model and we have built in you know we have built in an esg screen to sort of like screen businesses based off of their proposed business practices and if they're not proposing to operate their business in a way that's good for the environment, that's good socially for the community and culturally responsible, and it has good governance, and they're not allowed to participate. You know, so it's like we're actually putting in a screen of like, hey, what companies can actually participate here as a means to sort of like regulate this unchecked capitalism and like, you know, try and, you know, try and bring some sense of, you know, just some sense of like order and sort of like conscious capitalism in the mix. Will it work? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I I have certainly heard lots of arguments fearing corporatization. I look at the cannabis industry over the last decade, and there's a lot not to like, and there's a lot there to criticize. I, I don't disagree with any of that. I just don't know if in the long term it's ultimately avoidable, and I think it's even able to be argued that corporatization already exists. So... How do you get away from it? How do you how do you make this available to people and have literally no dollars involved? How do you do that? And how do you do it safely? Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So I, I think ultimately people probably are going to have to come full circle and make peace with the notion, you know, much in the same way like you look at American yoga. It, it's not yoga. It's the look of yoga, but none of the substance. But you know, even though that's the majority around the country, if you're really into yoga and you care about the substance, you're still going to get it and you know where to get it. So the fact that other people don't have as deep a passion or love for the subject as you do doesn't mean you're not going to be able to have that deep abiding passionate love for this as well, even though other people may enjoy it in a less revered fashion, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think the big piece of it is like, hey, are we properly sort of like honoring where these you know medicines have came from are we giving back to those communities are we creating systems that are doing 
good in the world and not doing harm. You know, and you, you know, and those I think are like you know some big like guiding principles for me, like how to move this you know forward. You know, it's like yes, yeah, so like if someone comes in, you know, and you know, and they you know, and they corporatize yoga and they don't like you know, and people are getting harmed by the poses that are happening, then it, then it's an issue. You yeah. know, it's, you know, so it's like <clears throat> you know, so it's like how do we like just make sure that it's like with something so powerful as natural psychedelics that it's, you know, that we're not causing harm. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I, I'm all in favor of, of passing through this moment of prohibition through a time period of regulation with the eye towards possibly in three generations or more emerging on the other side of that regulation and deciding as a civilization We've now incorporated this as a cultural feature and no longer need the regulation. I was talking about this a couple of uh, episodes ago on the show with somebody else. And what I was suggesting was much like alcohol. Sure, we do have regulation around it, but, you know, you get most of your alcohol education at home or in the classroom as a young, young student. You're not going to a department of alcohol to learn your alcohol consumption and, and uh, you know, all of those effects. So right now, I think nationally, psychedelics is not in the psyche, not part of the culture. And to just blanketly decriminalize with no help, no instruction, no safety nets, that would be dangerous. But again, you build what you guys are doing in Colorado, what they're doing up in Oregon, in other places. I think that serves as a great bridge to get the public educated, knowledgeable, comfortable, and therefore safer and smarter about it. And yeah, I think within three generations, you could look at maybe repealing those regulations as no longer necessary because they turn into cultural norms. Yeah, I mean, hopefully, yeah, hopefully sooner, you know, the, um, you, know you definitely get a difficulty once you get entrenched regulatory bodies, but. Um, no, no argument, no argument. But I'd rather have the entrenched regulatory body than total prohibition. Agreed. Agreed. You know, and it, yeah, and, and, you know, and that's like kind of really like kind of what we try to do is we try to like thread the needle here, you know, and, and really put together something that's, um, you know, can move the ball forward in a responsible way, you know, based off of the fact that we haven't had a public facing psychedelic system um, absent, you know, you know, absent Amsterdam, like really ever, you know, and, you know, in modern, you know, in like modern you know, U.S. society, uh, absent, you know, absent religious use. But. Yeah, uh, well, we've got our little pockets here and there of, of religious organizations that engage. And, and then, you know, the black market recreational people, but federal government doesn't really count them. Well, not on the list we'd want them to count them. Yeah, no, that's true. And, you know, and it's just a start. You know, I think that there's a lot of work you know, there's a lot of work to be done. There'll be a lot of evolution. I think we'll see, you know, like more states, you know, trying to do something similar provided this passes. You know, I think we'll be able, you know, I think people will try and tackle, you know, the microdosing issue and sort of like the offsite sales issue and the, you know, the personal freedom to, you know, eat psychedelics wherever you want to, you know, you know, like all these issues will be tackled in due time. You know, I think we just have to start somewhere. Yeah. Agreed. So I see we've got about 10 minutes left. So if I can turn the conversation to how do people get involved? What help do you need? Um, so let's, let's turn that direction if we can. So yeah. how do people get involved? How do they help? So I think a couple of things, you know, you know, one, you know, full disclosure, you know, I am, you know, I'm also chair of the campaign committee, um, you know, and so, um, you know, I think, you know, one way, you know, that, we definitely appreciate is, you know, is volunteering or donations, you know, it's, you know, monetary donations will allow us to get our message out more. Um, you know, so that's like a big help for those who are in Colorado. We've been organizing, you know, sort of an ambassador program, a very decentralized network of folks to, you know, talk to their community and, you know, and, and we've been equipping them with the, with the right tools and, you know, to really get out there and like have conversations about the benefits of this. Um, you know, so I think those are sort of like two pieces right now. Um, 
you know, for those who want sort of like the simple thing, it's like, Hey, you know, you know, encourage people to watch, you know, Michael, Michael Pollan's, you know, you know, Netflix documentary, you know, help people get some background and understanding of these issues. Um, you know, the big piece you know, where we're all going to have to come together though, is, you know, once this passes is on the implementation side, you know, it's going to be so crucial to have every single person's voice in the room when these regulations are being made. You know, and making sure that we can, you know, have a truly like inclusive, um, powerful, meaningful process around what this looks like. And the only way we can do that is with, you know, the experts in the field and that, you know, those who, you know, who know, you know, who really know this space and then practicing with these medicines. And so, you know, it's like being involved in that implementation side, I think will be really key. Mm -hmm. um, any budget set for fundraising? Do you have a goal that you're trying to reach that's advertised? Um, we don't, we don't have a public goal, um, you know, that we're trying, you know, that we're trying to reach, you know, it's, you know, really like anything can, you know, anything can help, you know, in sure. that regard. Well, anybody would take infinite money. I would <laughs> <laughs> never a maximum, but you know, sometimes people will put the, you know, pledge goal thing on their website. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if, if people wanted to donate money, where, where would they go? You've got a website. Yes. Let's, yeah. Let's Natural Medicine Colorado. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Let's see, and it's, it's that simple. Naturalmedicinecolorado.org. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a donate measure, there's a get involved measure, there's some research, you can read the text of the measure. Um, it's, it's all right there. And, and, and folks can also, you know, reach out to me as well. You, you know, you know, happy to sort of, you know, talk through, um, you, know, you know, some more of the nuances, you know, the nuances of the measure, or, you know, where we think, you know, different, um, pain points might be an implementation, but, uh, you know, you know, but the big thing is, you know, it's a go to our website, get on our email list. There'll be events, get involved, donate if you can. Uh, and that's, you know, let's make history. That's going to be really, it's going to be a really transformative, uh, it's going to be a really transformative bill. You know, you know probably, you know, when I, when I look at, when I compare it to, you know, cannabis, it's like, yes, the cannabis that provides like symptomatic palliative relief for so many people. Um, but psychedelics like transform people, you know, and, you know, I think this bill has like the chance to like transform, um, you know, transform our society, you know, and, and pave the way, you know, for more access to these healing medicines. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, the sad reality is we have lived as a civilization really almost since the founding of the country with no basis of this knowledge in the popular culture. And it's really just down to what we don't know what we don't know. But we look at other cultures that have embraced this for millennia. They're fine. They're not ripping each other apart. Their societies go on. People are happy. They're productive. A lot of them are capitalist even. Um, there's nothing that's necessarily, I would say, uh, contradictory to a good, healthy, well-ordered society. And your best example of this is 2,000 years of Greek history and the temple at Eleusis. Uh, for those who don't know, for almost 2,000 years, Greek culture had uh, the temple of Demeter at Eleusis, uh, a annual ritual where Greeks could go and participate and engage in what is widely understood and believed to be a psychedelic, or psychedelic uh, beverage known as kaikion. And... The deal was, if you were a Greek citizen and hadn't committed a murder, you were allowed to go once in a lifetime, usually when you were older, and partake in the Eleusinian mystery, which included your in ingestion of this psychedelic, and you would have a very intense psychedelic experience. And the little bit of uh, narration that's survived to this day makes clear the people who participated identified as forever changed. It wasn't a trifling, just, you know, festival where you go and eat a funnel cake and ride on a Ferris wheel and go home. No, no, this was an intense life altering in a good way experience. And Greek civilization embraced it for 2000 years. Yeah. We're barely 10% of that. So there's plenty of example in history of psychedelics and a society living together in productive and harmonious ways. Why not try that here? I agree. You know, you know, I think, you know, it's like psychedelics for me is, you know, has changed my life. And so like got me on this path of drug policy reform 18 years ago, you know, and, you know, and I'd encourage, 
not people to break the law, but people to explore their consciousness and, you know, and, hmm. and die. There. Don't break the law, change the law. <laughs> and that is what we are after right now. That's, that's what we're going for. All right. So listen, Colorado, if you're going to vote, go vote for this. And if you're not going to vote, change your mind and go vote for this. Uh, <laughs> besides this very important measure, there are a few other items of interest to the nation that might compel you to want to go vote. So please go vote and vote smartly. Josh, a few last word. What do you want to say? <laughs> you know, I think, I think my last word would, would, would echo that, you know, I think go vote, you know, we, we don't have like the actual number yet, but you know, I, probably be uh, prop 122 or there'll be some number that comes out know what it is go vote get all your friends to go vote and yeah and, and let's support you know making history and you know and really creating transformative policy here in colorado and and hopefully it'll trickle down to the rest of the the u.s and, and the rest of the world excellent and if the kids that don't want to reach you how can they do that josh <clears throat> um josh at vicente cedarberg dot uh, com very good lawyers, I will add. I'm not bad either. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, Josh, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks so much. Have a question about psychedelics and the law? You're welcome to submit them. Please send your questions to admin at psychedelicalex.com. Submission of questions is not an assurance that they will be used on the show. Also, please be aware that neither the submission of a question nor a response creates an attorney-client privilege between you and the show's host, nor does an answer constitute legal advice. Information provided is for general purposes only. If you need legal counsel, you should hire competent counsel in your community. Thank you.